Um, so today, as Sid mentioned, we're going to talk about estimating cardiac output with uh, point of care ultrasound uh, for the purposes of diagnosing shock as well as guiding therapy. Um, I think everybody on the call knows me. I'm Matt. Um, I don't have conflicts of interest related to this. All right, so the steps, the things that I'll take you through today are the rationale for this, for why you would do this, the accuracy of it, what's the actual process, how, what are some pitfalls of this, so how does it go wrong, and then finally, what are the applications, or, or in this case, one particular application that I'll highlight. So rationale, this is pretty obvious. Uh, if you have a patient in shock and the cause is not obvious, you should be assessing cardiac output. It is one of the uh, our new paradigm of flow, filling, and tone. It is the first one in that paradigm. So if you don't know cardiac output and you don't know why the patient's, patient's in shock, you should probably categorize their cardiac output as well as categorizing these other features. And it's important to remember that left ventricular ejection fraction is not the same as cardiac output. If, you're, if your EF is 10, are you less likely to have a normal cardiac output? Yes. But uh, it doesn't tell you the context of the situation, and it also doesn't tell you what the actual cardiac output is, just the EF. And remember, EF is very sensitive to loading conditions, so that can change at the drop of a hat. So how might we use this for shock therapeutics, on the other hand? Well, everyone knows that preload responsiveness is a potential use of uh, cardiac output determination, whether using echo or some other tool, because any preload responsiveness is trying to assess whether giving additional preload will raise the stroke volume. Next, how do I how do you titrate your vasoactives? Um, have you caused harm with your vasoactive medicines? So did adding that extra afterload cause you to develop a new problem? Or on the other hand, does this heart maybe need another a little more squeeze? And then finally, serial monitoring of patients who are not doing well. If the patient is having uh, worsening shock, you probably should re be reassessing this at any interval uh, where, where there's a significant change because the hemodynamics you saw a few hours ago may not be the hemodynamics of right now. So this is an ultrasound tool and it takes some uh, experience and some uh, some certain techniques to do it properly. So uh, in those in the situations where you're using it property, properly, is this something that's accurate? Well, in this study, which compared cardiac output as derived by pulmonary artery catheterization versus TTE cardiac output, you can see the correlation is extremely strong. Uh, the, R, the R value is you know, over 0.9. I can't remember what it is. I make all my references as QR codes. So if you want to read the paper, you just take a picture of the QR code and your phone will take you there. Um, and you can see cardiac output via PAC versus, uh, versus uh, the mean. Uh, sorry, the, the cardiac output versus the mean uh, in, in terms of limits of agreement uh, are very reasonable. And most of the values fell within the acceptable range. Additionally, when you look at how changes in cardiac output are documented uh, versus, by TE versus PAC, you can see those also correlate quite nicely, um, both in direction and magnitude. This is another review to suggest, or uh, systematic review and meta-analysis to suggest that cardiac output measurements uh, done by ECHO are very similar and you know, within acceptable limits uh, what's, as compared to thermal dilution. So the big idea is we're look, we're, we want to look at the blood flow going out the LVOT, and it's not just a, a disc, it's um, you know a jet of flow. So we're trying to take the area of that. So what we'll measure is something that looks like this. Of course, it's much prettier, and you'll see what it looks like across that uh, cross-sectional area with each systolic uh, cycle. The math behind this to actually get to the numbers that you want to get to, and I'll tell you how to obtain all these values in a moment, is you take the LVOT cross-sectional area, which is the uh, pi r squared of that area, uh, times the LVOT VTI, and that will yield the stroke volume. As you know, as you all know, stroke volume times heart rate will give you cardiac output, and then you index that with your body surface area to develop your uh, to derive your cardiac index. But that's all the math that you need. It seems like a lot, but it's all pretty easy. So first, let's talk about the views that we need in order to obtain this information. So everyone knows the parasternal long axis view, and we're uh, LVOT centric in this talk. So what you're going to do then is not just take this this image because how do you know you're measuring in the right spot when we're trying to measure our diameter? Well, the first thing to know to understand about ultrasound uh, per principles is that the sector in which you're measuring the uh, the images will affect your sp your spatial resolution. So if you make the sector a lot narrower, you can have increased uh, spatial resolution. And then on top of that, you may need to zoom. So when you uh, any echo machine that you use, you can take the sector down from this full sector that you normally see down to something like that. Um, every Again, every echo machine will do it. The controls to do it are slightly different on each machine. So you want to get down to an image that looks something like this. And you know it's a good image because I stole it from one of Sid's presentations. Um, is uh, get down to an image like this, and you're measuring in mid-systole, just below the aortic valve cusps, uh, in, in this plane. And that will be asked of you on echo boards, and you will see it because some people will put the measurement down here, or they'll put the measurement just above the valve. And this is exactly where you need to be. Um, remember, the diameter is not what goes into the equation, though. We're using the radius, so it's diameter divided by two. The neat thing is, most of the time, diameter is about two centimeters plus or minus 0.2. Um, so for, for whatever it's worth, if you can't obtain the value, you can assume that it's around two and uh, and work with uh, estimating your cardiac index that way. Additionally, as we'll talk about, knowing the normal values for LVOT, VTI will kind of obviate a lot of those, uh, the need for these calculations. But just remember, as you're doing serial VTI measurements, you don't need to continue to remeasure the LVOT diameter because that is relatively fixed. The next thing you need to do is move down to your apical four chamber position and actually drop the uh, probe angle down a little bit and obtain an apical five chamber view. Um, and I'm going to show you here this image with colored jet because the colored jet to me is very, very important. 
you can see this person here has aortic regurgitation, but it's very trivial. But what I really like to see is that nice laminar blue jet moving away from the probe out of the LVOT. That tells me that I'm in the right position to obtain an acceptable LVOT VTI jet. So once you've seen something that looks that pretty, and again, there it is for, for uh, emphasis that this is the LVOT jet in color Doppler, then you use your pulse wave uh, gate, uh, pulse, pulse wave Doppler, pulse wave gate, place it just below the valve, right exactly where you were measuring the LVOT diameter, and then you'll get something that looks really pretty like this, if you've done it right. Um, a couple of things that I want to highlight about this jet. So again, we're just measuring. Remember, pulse wave measures the uh, the velocity and the character of the wave right at the at that gate. So what we're looking at here is the blood flow across that area with each systolic uh, with each systolic cycle. Um, important things to know about pulse wave jets in general is that if you're trying to measure a velocity with a pulse wave, it should look something like this. You have a nice bright line around the outside and the inside is relatively dark. Um, and in this case, you even see a little bit of aortic valve click, which is another kind of reassuring sign that you're probably in the right spot. Um, once you have obtained that jet, then you would measure it uh, with a machine uh, as so, um, tracing the bright white parts and leaving out any little shaggy extra things that are probably just noise and not really the really the the value you're trying to obtain. And somewhere around 18 to 22 is probably the real value. Now, if it's 16, are you going to get excited about it? Probably not. So these things matter. Don't try not to think in cutoffs and try to think in you know gradients. So a 16, 17 is not going to get you too excited. A 10 would get you excited, assuming that you're meeting the proper criteria for use of this, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But that's what a nice jet looks like. But should you just measure one? No. Uh, short answer, um, if it's sinus rhythm, you should measure at least three uh, envelopes and then average those together. And if there's an arrhythmia, at least five, as, as many as 10. So you can see if you had a patient with atrial fibrillation, this would be very laborious. A couple of pitfalls to be aware of when measuring cardiac, when measuring the LVOT VTI. Um, the Doppler rank, as in any other ultrasound measurement using uh, pulse wave Doppler, or continuous wave Doppler for that matter, if your angle uh, is off more than 15 to 20 degrees from the main axis of the flow, um, you're going to underestimate the LVOT VTI. Um, secondly, if there is LVOT obstruction, which you may not necessarily detect when you're looking at the patient if they don't have an obvious uh, asymmetric hypertrophy, is the jet's going to be very pointy and have a very high uh, gradient, and it may be uninterpretable or it may, you know, over potentially make make your numbers look higher than they would be. Um, so in summary here, the Doppler angle being off by more than 15 to 20 degrees underestimate the value of the LVOT, VTI, and a dynamic over uh, LVOT obstruction may overestimate it, but it's going to look so funny that hopefully you know well enough not to measure it. Um, but we'll talk about that next. So when should you think that di dynamic LVOT obstruction may be present? Here are common conditions where it may happen. Everyone always thinks about hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy for this, and you should, because that is the most common scenario. But it can happen in the postmyocardial infarction patient, in the stress cardiomyopathy patient, like a Takatsubo patient, because they get apical ballooning and the, the base doesn't necessarily balloon out, and it's kind of relatively narrower. And then in our setting, hyperdynamic vasodilatory shock, very common scenario. So I hear a lot of echoes are reported off to me, either in the note or verbally, that the patient is hyperdynamic. I'll tell you most of the time we're overcalling what hyperdynamic is. That's the most important thing. But the second most important thing is if you think somebody's truly hyperdynamic, please look at their valves. Number one, make sure they don't have a, a acute AI or acute MR. Second of all, um, make sure you at least do a survey for LVOT obstruction. So what does dynamic LVOT obstruction actually look like? Now, this is a continuous wave Doppler, so single line. So we're going to get the highest velocity across the LVOT. Um, but what you can see here is this is a fairly normal uh, gradient across the aortic valve. And you hear, see here we get this really sharp sickling, um, which is very abnormal and suggests obstruction. Um, that obstruction could be occurring at any point across that line, though. It could be happening uh, mid-cavity, it could be happening in the LVOT, or that gradient could actually be in the ascending aorta. So how do you tell? I really like this diagram that the authors of this paper that are referenced here um, put into their um, put into their paper, because what they basically what they what they uh, suggest is if you have an elevated uh, gradient across the aortic valve, that you should do a survey for a dynamic LVOT obstruction across these various points. And here's what the normal values would look like. So at point A, which is like mid-cavity, um, it does look like a, a pulse wave jet forward flow away from the probe, but it's kind of flatter and softer than a normal LVOT jet. Uh, mark B here, which is at the LVOT, pretty obvious, uh, pretty pretty typical LVOT jet. And then finally, in the ascending aorta is what the uh, pulse wave Doppler jet would look like in that circumstance. But if it was, if there was obstruction here, you would see that peaking at whichever point that it was occurring at. And that's the benefit of pulse wave Doppler is you get to see the velocity at that location. All right, now just, uh, I, I'm now gonna borrow a case um, from Dr. Mogakar that I think is a really neat illustration of how you might actually use this value and integrate it into not only a diagnostic plan, but a treatment plan. So this is a 60 some odd year old lady who came to the ICU with a uh, horrid uh, circulatory shock of uncertain etiology. A bedside echo was done, which showed a dilated LV cavity and decreased systolic function. So what was done next was LVOT VTI measurements. 
So here we have LVO TBTI 7.5, 6.8, 6.5. So just totally abysmal. This is like a third of what's normal. So and you and, and look at his look at the the images here. The pulse wave gate is right where you'd want it to be. You can see he looks pretty on axis, um, and it's a beautiful image. So you say this is probably a reliable information. So this person looks like they're in cardiogenic shock. So what was done next was to add dobutamine. Uh, with the addition of dobutamine, the LVO TBTI went up from six to nine. Doesn't sound like all that much, but that's a 50% increase. So it was already an improvement in cardiac output here. And then finally, dobutamine plus nitroprusside for afterload reduction, and we get the LVO TBTI up to almost 12. So it almost doubled uh, across the course of this treatment. So not only was this a helpful diagnostic tool, but it was a helpful treatment tool. Finally, other therapeutics in which you might use serial measurement of the LVO TBTI and or cardiac output. Well, if you're assessing preload responsiveness, there's very few things that are reliable in every circumstance except for uh, measure, actually measuring cardiac output. And most of the time, we don't have a cardiac output monitor uh, to do that except for echo. So if you have reliable images, you could do your uh, passive leg raise, measure before, after, uh, and, and once you've returned the patient back to the original position. You could do a fluid challenge and actually measure it while the fluid's going in if it's going on under pressure bag. Um, the last thing that I would say is end expiratory occlusion test is another option in this case if the person's relatively passive on the ventilator. Um, this is another thing that should raise the LVO TBTI. And then you might ask, well, what kind of numbers am I looking for when I say that, that the, uh, there's a meaningful change? Well, if the LVO TBTI goes up by more than 10 to 15 percent, that is high enough that it's probably outside the realm of just um, you know being attributable to error. So anything above that would be helpful. But it's really important to keep in mind that um, that's not a patient-centered outcome, um, and it's not even a true clinical outcome. It's like a surrogate outcome. So if you went to a patient and you measured it and their VTI was nine and then you gave a treatment and their VTI was 12, you wouldn't go to the family and say, well, their VTI is 12, so I feel really good about myself. Um, you'd want to integrate this information with some other information about the patient. Do they look better clinically some other way? And then finally, uh, I just want to impress upon you all, things can change at the drop of a hat. So if you had somebody that was kind of doing okay um, on their 10 of norepi and then all of a sudden they're in three presser shock, this person needs a new echo, they need a cardiac output assessment, you need to try to figure out why that happened. And this is a tool that makes it easy to do that. What about the right ventricle? Um, I can't leave any talk without talking about the right ventricle. So you can perform these same measurements on the other side of the heart because, you know, blood goes round and round. So in this case, one uh, an appealing view to do this in would be the peristernal short axis at the basal level. And similarly, we would be putting a pulse wave gate right underneath the uh, pulmonary valve um, and going in this direction. And I'll show that in a moment. The other thing is a lot of our patients are very difficult to get this view in because of any number of factors. So what you can also do is do a subcostal short axis view. So this is basically the probe in the IVC position, but then you kind of uh, put a little bit more pressure and point a little bit up more towards the head. This is a great technique in people that have like sort of a scaphoid abdomen. Think about a COPD patient with a barrel chest. Uh, you can get beautiful views. You feel like you're looking, uh, it, it makes it seem like you're, you're looking with a transesophageal echo. And in that case, the pulmonary valve is here and you put the gate right about here. Similar to the LVO TVTI, you can put color right across this area um, and, and make sure that you're in the right spot. So here's an example of where you might put the pulse wave jet in this patient. Again, this is a beautiful image, and I think this is another one I stole from SIG and we put in paper. So this is where you would measure that. And unsurprisingly, the jet in normal circumstances looks quite similar to an LVO TVTI jet, and normal values are similar. Um, so this is a helpful piece of information, number one, if you can't get the information needed on the other side of the heart. But what's really, really neat about this is you can get information about the shape, uh, morphology, and the acceleration time about this jet to try to deduce what the cause of elevated pulmonary pressures are, pulmonary hypertension, and whether it's pre-capillary or post-capillary. But that is outside the scope of this talk, but I just want to let you know this is another place where you can measure cardiac output from. It is usually a more difficult view to get, um, but again, in those patients where you can get that subcostal short axis view, it's quite easy. So in closing, I, what I really want to emphasize is that cardiac output measurement by echo can be very accurate when done in the right ways, assuming that you're um, operating within the limitations of the, of the test, performing it at the proper angle, and making sure that your views are adequate. Remember, though, just like you wouldn't trust any number, any one number from any other source as gospel, the same thing applies here. This is somebody, this is, this is something that you can use to corroborate the information you're finding from other sources. Or if the echo is the first thing that you did to the patient, now you try to corroborate that low cardiac output with some something else, ideally clinical findings, but also um, blood gas parameters or other invasive hemodynamics. So these are all things that you need to consider. Overall though, it's a very useful technique. It will save you from doing more invasive things to people a lot of the time. And again, if you're gonna diagnose shock and you don't know what the cause of shock is, you need to be able to estimate the cardiac output. And believe it or not, that is it. <laughs>